Hey guys, Nintendrew here. Today, we'll be looking at a very strange piece of Nintendo's history with an interesting backstory and some pretty weird origins. This is the NJS 3D1, otherwise known as the Nintendo 3D1 joystick for PC. Yes, that's right, this is a fully functional flight stick licensed by Nintendo for use exclusively with home computers. Weird, right? In this video, we'll take a quick look at the NJS 3D1, talk a bit about its history, and see if we can get this thing working today on a modern computer. So, let's get to it. Alright, so here it is, the Nintendo 3D1 joystick. First up, let's get a good look at the hardware. At first glance, it should be pretty apparent that the NJS 3D1 is strongly modeled after the Nintendo 64 gamepad, with its iconic color scheme and unique structure. On the top of the unit, we've got a big red start button, along with two primary inputs and a circular directional pad. On the underside, you can see a red trigger button, as well as this oversized plastic knuckle guard. And moving down to the base, you will find four dedicated turbo switches, as well as an analog slider. And of course, we have the iconic Nintendo 64 logo down here in the center. Or so it would seem. If we take a closer look, you'll notice the joystick does bear the Nintendo name and the 3D N logo we've come to know and love. However, it's missing the superscript 64 text in the top right hand corner. Remember, this joystick is not compatible with Nintendo's 64-bit home console, which makes this whole thing all the more confusing. But more on that later. If we take a look at the underside of the stick, you'll find there's a three-way switch up here at the top. This indicates which mode the joystick runs in. At position 1, the joystick will emulate the CH Flight Stick Pro. In mode 2, it will emulate the Thrustmaster Pro. In either of these modes, the four blue buttons on the base act as individual turbo switches for the buttons on the handle. So for example, enabling the first blue button will cause the corresponding button up top to rapid fire when held. But in position 3, or gamepad mode, these four turbo switches are swapped with the face buttons up above, allowing them to work as primary input. On the underside, we can also see a label with the controller's model number, and a tiny little disclaimer which reminds us that this joystick is indeed for use with PC computers only. True to its name, the 3D1 joystick does indeed have three separate axes of input. Of course, you can move the stick to the left and right and up and down as you would with any other typical analog controller, but you can also rotate the stick clockwise or counterclockwise for an additional axis of control. This feature was adopted from more high-end flight sticks of the 90s, and for what it's worth, the NJS 3D1 was fairly unique in having such a wide set of features for being a more budget-friendly controller. This joystick was released in July of 1997 with an MSRP of $69.99, and although it was licensed by Nintendo and bears the Nintendo name, it was actually produced by a third-party manufacturer by the name of Laurel Group LLC. This is where things get kind of weird. In a debut press release announcement, the company bragged that the revolutionary NJS 3D1 is the only PC computer joystick on the market good enough to wear the Nintendo name, and it is marketed exclusively by Laurel. So the question remains, how did Laurel Group get Nintendo to agree to let a third-party company release a controller with their logos for use outside of their own platform? Well, the answer's not exactly clear, but this is what we do know. The NJS 3D1 was part of a larger branding deal in which Laurel planned to release a wide offering of Nintendo branded accessories, uh, but the only other one which actually made it to market was this. The Nintendo Wireless Infrared Stereo Headphone System. Quite a mouthful. This accessory had two major components, an infrared transmitter which would be placed above the user's television, and the headset itself which would receive those IR signals and interpret them as audio. Unlike the 3D1 joystick, the wireless headphone system was intended for use with home consoles like the N64. But what's interesting about this is that, as we can see on the back of the packaging, it was advertised for use in conjunction with the joystick. Now of course it's possible that this was just a marketing error or a form of creative liberty in advertising, but one fan's theory might just bring this controller's clouded history to light. In a post on the Nintendo Age forums, a user by the name of C0 proposed this scenario. Perhaps Laurel Group was originally planning to make this stick for the N64, and signed a contract with Nintendo to that effect, before losing the rights to produce the peripheral by some unknown means. 
We know from experience that Nintendo is no stranger to changing their minds about business decisions last minute. And if the business contract between the two companies somehow guaranteed Laurel the right to use the Nintendo name, they may have decided to go forward with their plans and just produce the joystick for the PC market instead. Again, this is all speculation, so take it with a grain of salt. But if this is the case, it would explain a lot about how the NJS 3D1 came to be. Now, of course, because this thing came out over two decades ago, it's no surprise that it's running on some outdated technology. Unfortunately for us, that means that using this controller today isn't quite as easy as just plugging in a USB cable. No, the NJS 3D1 instead uses a GamePort plug. GamePort was a 15-pin device standard commonly found in home computers throughout the 80s and 90s, and served as the industry standard until it was eventually overtaken by USB in the early 2000s. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I do not have a 20-year-old PC lying around the house, so I had to find a way to get it to work with my modern desktop. After a bit of research, I found that the only real reliable solution was to buy a specific game port to USB adapter by Rockfire, which, judging by the packaging, may be almost as old as I am. But regardless, after attaching the joystick's game port plug to the converter, the controller will function just like any other generic USB plug-and-play gamepad. So, time to put it to the test. And what better way to try out this bizarre Nintendo 64 themed flight stick than by emulating one of the games it may have originally been intended for, Star Fox 64. Unfortunately, the years have not been especially kind to this particular unit, so my gameplay was impacted by some really erratic and unpredictable values coming from that analog stick. But I was able to tweak some settings and get it to a somewhat playable state. I am no expert in repairing controllers, so maybe eventually I can learn how to repair this thing to its former glory. But for now, this will do. And it's enough to give us a glimpse as to how it might have functioned had it been made for Nintendo's own platform. As you might notice here, one thing I found really cool and intuitive for this title was to use the joystick's third axis in place of the Z and R triggers. This meant I could twist the stick to rotate the R wing and perform barrel rolls and other maneuvers. And despite some difficulty with the other axes of input, I was still able to make my way through the game's first few levels with relative ease. If any game on the 64 could have benefited from this style of input, Star Fox 64 would be it. But of course, I couldn't just stop there. For a second run, I decided to try my hand at GoldenEye. PC joysticks and first-person shooters of the 90s go hand in hand, so I thought this would be an interesting way to see if this controller was an exception. Unfortunately, this one didn't go quite as well as Star Fox 64, and I had a really hard time trying to pick off enemies from a distance with the joystick's jumpy input. But that's probably just a matter of wear and tear over the years. I can't imagine it would have been quite this bad on launch day. But despite those difficulties, I was able to eventually work my way through the first level. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't try this thing with Nintendo's flagship 3D platformer, Super Mario 64. And, uh, say what you will about the original 64 controller, but this title was certainly not meant for a joystick. You're much better off sticking to the real deal. Finally, just for the heck of it, I thought for one last test, I'd try using the 3D1 joystick with a more modern PC title. Recently, I've been replaying through Grand Theft Auto V, so that's what I chose for this experiment. And, uh, you probably know where this is going. It worked just about as well as you'd expect. But that's honestly not anything against the controller itself. I just thought it would be fun and a little bit ridiculous to try to get this 22-year-old peripheral working with a modern AAA PC game. And it works! All in all, the NJS 3D1 was a surprisingly fully featured joystick for its time and for the price of entry. And it definitely stands as a particularly weird outlier as an official Nintendo controller bearing the Nintendo seal of quality. And finally, as a lifelong fan of the N64, I think it's a curious and wonderful part of that system's history, even if it never worked directly with the console. But let me know what you think. Did you ever use or own this joystick yourself? Would you like to see Nintendo dabble in the PC market again? Make sure to leave your thoughts and comments down below. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed the video. As always, if you did, please do consider subscribing to Nintendrew for all sorts of cool and obscure gaming content, and feel free to share it with any friends who might find it interesting. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye! Hey guys, thanks again for watching and for making it all the way to the end of the video. Hope you enjoyed. 
If you're curious about some of Nintendo's other oddball controllers throughout the years, Nathaniel Bandy has a brand new video on the entire lineup of official gamepads, so make sure to check it out if you get the chance. I made a small cameo over there and I, I think you'll enjoy. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Take care.